financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my co-host Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, with us for this episode is John Waro of the Associated Press. Great time to have John on because he covers pretty much everything in Buffalo. Bill's about to start. Sabres starting to come back to life after their dormant summer period. The Professional Women's Hockey League has made some big announcements, and John has been all over that coverage. It's really become a specialty of his, uh, which I know he's proud of, and uh, he's done some great work in covering that league, um, and a lot of people are overlooking it, and uh, John has been at the forefront. But we also have PSE stuff, Chad Kelly as the new Doug Flutie, (laughs) uh, as Jonah was saying. Um, what else? I mean, uh, the, there was a fire at Salem Field today. Looked Game's still won. Was. And Patrick Kane's got something going on that John's reporting, right? Correct. Yesterday, yes, I spoke to Pat. Um, so where do we start? Let's just start with the Bills. They set their roster since the last time uh, we spoke, Joan and I, that is, although John and I speak pretty much every day anyway, but... Um, any any surprises? And it was one of the things that we spoke about last week that we didn't expect many surprises. Uh, Vandemark, even he's the biggest surprise, but that was telegraphed a bit, especially with Brandon Shell's uh, retirement and then uh, Sweeney's uh, season-ending injury. Um, I don't know. Uh, we talked last week about Kingsley Jonathan making the roster possibly, and he did. So what? I don't know, John, what were your takeaways uh, since you're the guest on, uh, on the 53 man roster and the moves that were made? Well, I mean, what intrigued me was that they did cut AJ Klein and they got an, what, what should be an upgrade, I guess, in this Kings, uh, this Kirksey guy, um, not knowing that he would be released, but I, maybe they were anticipating this would happen. Um, but after AJ Klein, you know, has, has had reps at that position, even starting reps in replacing Tremaine, they just gave up on him. And I guess they decided that Kirksey's just a better, uh, is an upgrade, is an upgrade there and brought him in. He's going to spend time on the practice, practice squad and how long it takes him to get up to speed. I don't know. Is he now the Bills incumbent or heir apparent middle linebacker? He comes in with an injury. Uh, and uh, early recovering from an injury. So that uh, allows him a little bit more of a ramp up time on the practice squad. This is something the teams used to not be able to do because of the limitations put on practice squad players. They could not have been of a certain vintage. They had to be young or um, few games played. There was a formula, of course, and that was opened up uh, within the last couple of years regarding veterans being on your practice squad. And it allows uh, for the Bills to keep guys around and uh, see them in in action a little bit, work them into the system rather than say, all right, Kirksey, you got to be on the 53 and then deciding whether or not you're going to dress him on Monday night because he's ready. Is he not ready? So, uh, you know, practice squad's a pretty good spot for that. Kirksey, of course, has the experience. Uh, He's done a little bit of everything. Uh, He's, he's been in the league a long time. Uh, He can pressure the quarterback a little. He seems to have a nose for the ball. I think, though, that when it comes to linebackers, much like running backs, so much of it's instinctual uh, right. that it's, you know, see ball, get ball, um, you know, see hole, hit the hole, you know, all that type of stuff. Now, if he's going to be in that middle linebacker spot and Sean McDermott, McDermott wants him to wear that green dot, of course, he's going to have to learn way more than just getting out there and being reactive. But um, I, I could see as if his health allows and he's in, in his recovery that he could be he could be the Bills. uh middle linebacker relatively quickly. 
Um, I'm curious to see if this tail, you know, and and there, there seems to be some speculation or or maybe some informed knowledge that, um, and and I've not seen this, but it, it makes sense that Taylor Rapp might wind up being the second middle linebacker on the field in passing situations, yeah, like in a de facto sense, almost yeah. like a dime package in a in a nickel setup. Right. So, I mean being acknowledged that, you know, there are certain positions that he can't pay. And that was one of them this off season. So I'm curious to see how they get through this defense gets through without having a real proven or I guess established middle linebacker after having Tremaine Edmonds there and Milano there for five years. Jonah, your thoughts on the, uh, on the roster as it's set. Well, I don't think, in its own sense that the Boogie Basham trade was much of a surprise. I think a lot of people saw that the Bills would have to make a move there with one of their young defensive linemen, and a lot of people probably predicted the trade. But I think taking a step back and looking at it as a second-round pick from not that many years ago, from three in, entering his third season, the return that they got for him, trading a second-round pick now before the roster cut downs two years in a row, and – Basham being a perplexing pick from his positional standpoint when they made it in the first place, having taken Greg Rousseau in the first round and AJ Epinesa the year before. Um, not a surprise, but a, a kind of, uh, you know, one failing of the roster construction, the way the Bills have done their business over the last couple of years. And not alarming because the, the, the Brandon being such, done such a good job assembling the roster overall, but in its own context, kind of a, you know, a, you know, poor reflection on, on that draft class and that draft decision. Well, let's, let's extrapolate that and, and talk about what you just mentioned there, Jonah. There's been a lot of talk about uh, how, how good it has Brandon Bean been as the Bills general manager. And you mentioned a couple of the edge rushers. I don't know if, did you get all of them? We had Epinesa, Rousseau, Basham. That's a lot of early draft capital in addition to still needing to sign Von, uh, signing Von, st I'll spit it out still needing to sign Von Miller to the big deal last year and then of course Leonard Floyd's more a, a product of needing to replace Von Miller but still if one of these younger guys that you picked to fill this role is ready to step up then they don't need to go out and get Leonard Floyd um They've offensive linemen, and all the different things. Obviously, they got the Josh Allen pick, and uh, he was able to maneuver and do trades and get in there. But is big baller Bean losing some of his shine here? I think in the I draft. Think, go ahead, Jonah. I just yep. want to say specifically with the defensive line, they brought in veteran defensive linemen in free agency every year, while also drafting young defensive linemen, and and that's maybe part of the defense that they play in rotating four different spots and needing a lot of bodies, but also bringing back somebody they had moved on from in Shaq Lawson and then Kingsley Jonathan that, you know, that's kind of good that they can get an undrafted rookie and get him back after waving him a year ago and still have him on the roster. But if you can do that, then maybe some of the high picks and the free agent acquisitions were overspends at that position. And I think specifically with Basham, because he was the second player at the same position taken back to back in the top of the same draft. And I think some of us were scratching our heads at the time. And that turned out to be, a relatively wasted asset for the Bills. Oh, yeah. I mean, you look back at Zach Moss. I mean, he's gone. They got him for 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 Naheem Hines, who's not on the – well, who's hurt. But, yeah, I mean, you can't anticipate that. But it's it's been a let's mixed – let, let, let's, let's set the whole picture, too, right. because we're going to be picking at him here, too. So let's throw out some other names. Kair Elam is not a clear starter yeah. yet in entering his second year. Um, you know, uh, is Dawson Knox his best day two hit? Uh, I Matt Milano. Oh, yeah. Oh, day three. I'm sorry. Day three. Yeah. That would be day three. Right. Day two has been a true, the, the, those Fridays have been a struggle, I guess, for them. Um, if you really look at it, but, you know, the, it's, it's, it's been a mixed bag. And sure, you really credit him for finding the anchor of the franchise quarterback. Um, for this roster, but you know, it was Tremaine Edmonds. If they really thought that much of Tremaine Edmonds, they would have kept the bank. You know, they they would have put set that money aside for Tremaine Edmonds rather than knowing that they were going to lose him this year. So, um, there are question marks in regards to the draft and 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 his drafting history. I do like the fact that Brandon acknowledged on whatever we spoke to him a couple of days ago that he is going to look back and look at what went wrong with the Boogie Basham pick, you know, what, how, how they graded him, 
um, how their interviews went with him. I will say this. One thing that you can ex- – I think we should all look back at the COVID draft because that was the COVID draft and how every team um, succeeded or maybe not succeeded during the COVID draft because it was so tough to – everybody was scouting these players essentially by video or had very little video on them because they didn't play that year should be pointed out that while Brandon Bean did join the Bills in 2017, it was after the draft. So Matt Milano was actually a Doug Whaley pick. Right. You're right. Um, but you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, it was yeah. Doug Whaley and his scouting. Those are those reports, especially when you're getting into the fifth round. I don't think Sean McDermott is exuding his influence on a fifth round pick. So win one for Doug, for Doug Whaley. Um, and oh shoot, there was another name I wanted to throw out there that I, that it just uh, evaporated. Um, about another miss. Oh, Wyatt Teller, because you were talking there, John, about how Brandon Bean wanted to go back and reevaluate, and he brings up Wyatt Teller unsolicited all the time. It is as one that is really sticking with him, especially at a position the Bills really could have used help. Yeah, uh, obviously uh, last year Wyatt Teller at left guard. Uh, maybe makes the difference uh, because Saffold uh, struggled a little bit. Uh, although then again, with the sequence of things that befell the bills uh, out of their control, I don't know if, uh, if Wyatt Teller wins them a Super Bowl after DeMar Hamlin drops dead for uh, a couple of minutes. That's um, a different kind of miss than some of the, the other ones we're talking about or Cody Ford uh, not working out here, but, you know, Boogie Basham could turn out to be one of those cases. He could turn out to be a guy that's the player the Bills thought they were drafting. The failing with him seems to be not bringing in too many players at that position and not really having enough opportunity of him getting squeezed out of a roster, which is not what you want to see with a second-round pick three years down the line. Now, if he turns out to not be a good player for the Giants or anywhere else, then it's a you know failure in the pick and more of an Aaron Maven-type situation. Interesting about Cody Ford. I don't know if you guys saw the video. It was actually very yeah. entertaining of he and his, uh, whether it was his wife or girlfriend, significant other, uh, a couple of minutes before four o'clock, sweating out whether or not they were going to get the phone call and whether or not he was going to make the roster. And it was great. It was good to see. I'm not, uh, but it just goes to show that Cody Ford still is sweating out trying to make a roster. And clearly when the Bills drafted him, they viewed him as an anchor to that offensive line or else they wouldn't have taken him where they did. And so another miss by Bean. I mean, he's had some hits. Obviously, the biggest hit that you can have, you know, if he's coming up with, you know, two outs and a and a runner on third down by one in the bottom of the ninth, then he, you know, sent one over the left field fence uh, for Josh Allen. So he's he hits. He does. He has made some pretty damn good contact. But there've been a lot of swings and misses. Um, what do we think about the Bills here entering the? Uh, the AFC East in 2023. I think it's an interesting time, a very competitive division, uh, and the Bills, I think everybody started to close the gap on the Bills last season, and the gap is probably closing a little bit more now, especially when a pretty good Jets team, even Jets finished last, but they were pretty they were pretty good. They gave the Bills some problems. They showed glimpses. If they had a quarterback, well, now they have a quarterback. Uh, and then, of course, the Dolphins are always making moves and always in the, the Patriots. Eh, maybe maybe the Patriots have their reset season here and uh, win four games. But where are we? Where are we with the AFC East? I, I still think the Bills are the favorites. And, you know, I think a lot of people overlook. And um, I was at a bar a couple of nights ago. Surprise, surprise. But I was talking to my bartender and, and he goes, oh, the Bills offense isn't going to be so bad. And I, I said, actually, I think the receiving core, the group of receivers they have, when you factor in Scherfeld, um and and Hardy and Dalton Kincaid, I'm not going to say he's going to play a big role. But I think when you add those three elements into the mix, I think they're they're they're, they're better as far as receivers go this year than they were a year ago when we know that Isaiah McKenzie – couldn't fill that role. I think they have more answers on. Well, how about offense. this? Just while you're talking about Isaiah McKenzie, there, John, uh, we had uh, you know fantasy expert Dave Richard on on the podcast about this time last year, and and I agreed with him. I'm not saying that we were talking about Isaiah McKenzie being the big sleeper of maybe the NFL heading into the season because he was going to be the number three guy out of the slot for Josh Allen, and now Isaiah Isaiah McKenzie was cut by the Colts. 
and he was resigned, of course. And I embarrassingly asked the question because <laughs> I wasn't on social media. I didn't realize that the man had been resigned already. But anyway, it would have been an interesting answer to see if Brandon Bean was be like, no, nah, we're set. We don't need the guy who was our third best receiver last year. I think that's true. I, I don't I don't think that they need him anymore. And that it just goes to show, you know, your point in in practical purposes and in in uh, in reality that I think that the Bills would view Isaiah McKenzie as 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 nobody who would supplant anybody else. Well, I think the pre the Peter principle worked there. I think he got as as good. He was great as a gadget guy in Dable's off offense. Maybe he should go to the Giants because Dable seemed to get the the most out of him. But let's remember that was a limited role. And when you give him an expanded role, it just did not work. Um, oh, yeah. Isaiah Hodgins, another one the Bills let go that they could have used. Correct, correct. Speaking of Giants, Bills receivers going to the Giants. So, right. and But I, I just think that, you know, Isaiah McKenzie just – he he – he got as he was as good as we were going to see under Brian Dable. And if you give him an expanded role, it just did not work for some reason. And I think the Bills have more answers on offense this year. So we're, when we're looking at a lot of people are down on the Bills. Oh, you know, the the, the Dolphins are, are this much better. Or, but the Dolphins still have two, two up, which I'm just, just going to stop there so I don't butcher his name. Um, and I'm just still not convinced on Tua. And, and the Bills seem to have answers. Um, against them, if you go back to that first game in the Heat, they had that team beat. They they, they almost won that game, and I've not seen Tua perform well against the Bills in consistent stretches. Aaron Rodgers, yes, he's an upgrade over what the Jets had last year, but the Jets didn't have a quarterback last year. So, and the Jets' defense gave the Bills fits, but I still think the Bills. If they can split with the Jets as they did last year, if they split with the Dolphins as they did last year, I still think the Bills are the favorite to win the AFC East. I agree with John. I think the Bills are better and maybe even more spots than just receivers. You can include the tight ends. I think the running back situation is better, potentially both offensive and defensive line and a healthier secondary. Aside from the middle linebacker position, there's a lot of reasons to think the Bills are as good or better as a roster than they were last year when they were – preseason Super Bowl favorites and maybe the best performing regular season team in the entire league, despite all the injuries. That said, they are in the toughest, perhaps the toughest division in football and maybe even historically difficult in terms of how good all four teams are at the same time. And the question is, how much could that affect even the best team in the division? How much will these teams beat up on each other and it be a bit of like a bloody primary before they get to the playoffs and different circumstances from a year ago, but another maybe situation where the Bills or whoever wins the AFC East, uh, you know, can't get to the 15th round of the fight because they had to fight so hard to win the first 14 rounds and how that could possibly affect the Bills or any of the teams getting to the Super Bowl and the finish line. I think that the Bills' biggest challenger this year is going to be New York um, and not Miami because I think Miami – you know, there's, and again, this is not any kind of analytic or a DVOA type take. It first off, if Tua Tagovailoa can stay on the field uh, all season, it'll be a minor miracle. Um, and this is a team that is constantly flirting with getting better. Which, I mean, all right, let me, all right, let me rephrase that. It's a team that's constantly flirting with. Um, we don't think we're good enough at X, Y, Z position. They're always. <laughs> They're always kind of knocking their own players in a in kind of a, a backwards right. way. They're very publicly going after any big shiny object that's out there. And it even goes back to before last season when they were flirting with uh Deshaun Watson and there are the talks about Sean Payton and and Tom Brady coming in and all these things like they're not necessarily happy with their coach. They're not necessarily happy with their quarterback. They're not necessarily happy with their running back. And I'm not saying that that takes a mental toll on the team. I'm, I think that Chris Greer is a pretty smart football guy. I think it's a sign of a team that is not comfortable with who it is. Right. And the Jets, I think, are very comfortable with who they are. I think Robert Sala has, has installed a culture there and, and with the defense first, and now they've added the quarterback. I think that puts them over the hump in terms of competing in the division, not necessarily contending for Super Bowls. But I think that the Dolphins, to me, just feel as an outside observer, seeing how they act, seeing their right. behavior, they seem like a team that just doesn't 
doesn't have it doesn't feel like it has what it takes and that to me is is significant and, and that's what you have, and that's when you have Tyreek Hill and, and Waddell who are burning up the league no matter who is the quarterback I mean at some point you have to like what you have but in and I do agree with you it's like you just never know what what the Dolphins are going to do and that shiny object sure does sure does lure them um, in, in, in so many ways. And we saw that this offseason, too. Johnny, you were saying? Well, they just, the Dolphins have this unserious demeanor that starts with the head coach, and he's That's very true. entertaining, and, and I enjoy it personally, and I think a lot of NFL fans do. But An owner that them, doesn't like to follow the rules. Right. Uh, and, and, their and, uh, leaks get out left and right. You always know who they're after, and I, that doesn't always come from – the team that they're talking to. I mean, it's the dolphins are in every frigging discussion. And I think anyways, I'm sorry, Jonah, but I, I agree. Well, and down to the way they handled to his injury last year and some of the personality that comes out of that team, which might make them fun to watch and root for in some ways, but it doesn't inspire championship belief. And they might prove us all wrong with that. But before it happens, they just seem like an unserious team that you, you really can't consider as they're going to be the one standing in the end. That's a great point in the way you worded it, because I think I, I believe that. But to hear you articulate it, it really drives it home. Yeah, they're not a serious team or like they don't act right serious. Now, if you're so goddamn good that you don't give a shit, but they haven't done it yet. They haven't. Um, you know, there's the, that belief needs to at some point you need like the, the Rex Ryan Jets. At some point you need to have the pelts on the wall. You need to be able to look at and say, this is what we've accomplished. And we have this, uh, and that all kind of is the, I know I use the word culture a lot. Some people don't even believe that culture is even a, a real thing because you can't put an analytic to it. But, uh, at some point you need to have concrete success. Um, not just backing into the playoffs, not just, uh, you know, some, getting a big win on the road at some point or being competitive or like Jonah said, being fun. You, your culture needs to still be rooted in, in winning. Speaking which, is I, I, which, which is why I, I still go back to because there are a lot of detractors of Sean McDermott. He's got to be fired. This is his make it or break it year. Meanwhile, he just got re-upped. Uh, with a two-year contract extension, and 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 he can't win the big game. Perhaps that may that, that might be the case, but there have been some. I, I'm defending Sean in in saying that he does have some of those pelts on the wall. There have been missteps, um, 13 seconds most notably, but he has made this team in. He has established a winning culture on this team since his arrival, and I think that is what is really missing from whether it's because of all the rotational change that happens with coaches in Miami. It just, it's not apparent in Miami, but I, I sensed it in Buffalo when he got here and then when Bean arrived and it's still ever presently clear with the core of this team that marches to McDermott's beat. Yeah. He's had some missteps, obviously 13 seconds, the playoff game down in Houston. There's a bunch of things, but he has won division titles, right? He has, coached a team that has hosted playoff games. Uh, he has gotten his team through some very unusual circumstances that no other coach in the NFL can say, not even Bill Belichick. You know, not there's people who've been around a long, long time who haven't experienced what Sean McDermott has. Uh, and so his, his pelts on the wall are maybe a little more abstract beyond the division titles. You know, yeah. uh, his, his pelt on the wall might be, you know, Damar Hamlin, the winning three road games in 12 days, uh, you know, including losing a home game in there. Yeah. Um, it could, there are, you know, a lot of different things that, that he can point to. Um, Mike McDaniel cannot. Um, but again, I, I like Mike McDaniel. He is entertaining and I like his, his, I like his attitude. I like his, I, it's adds to the NFL. Um, but there's, there's just something about it. Maybe maybe it's I'm scarred from having covered Rex Ryan in, in two locations. I I did cover I was still at AFC uh, the AFC East reporter for ESPN when uh, when Rex was with the Jets and and then I got to see the encore in which he played all the greatest hits that he had already played earlier in the concert uh, in Buffalo. I'd already heard all those songs. Um, the oversized Clemson helmet was the key, was the clincher. Let's not forget the pickup truck. True. Yes. Um, 
Or you have the dog biscuit, the bicycle built for two, which Jonah was uh, famously uh, owned the rights to that photograph. Or at least yeah, he broke it. Not a lot of substance. Uh, John, before we go much further, I do want to uh, ask you a question, a probing. I think it's a probing question. Why did you go with the blurred background today? Uh, and because not... I'm in my basement. Oh, I see. And we don't want to see... Yeah, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. What about what's wrong with your office? Um, this is this is my this is my smoking section when I'm busy writing a whole bunch of features and I've got nothing else to do. And so I just decided to stay down here because I've pretty much been just down here for much of the last couple of days, just writing, writing, writing. Do we want to go ahead and smoke on the podcast like we're on the Mike Douglas show or I'm Earth, good. like I'm back good. in the day? Um <laughs> Nothing like that. I mean, we don't want to do old Johnny Carson. Um, I'm I'm good. I'm good. You're allowed. That's that's perfectly fine. No, it's like I I I just don't want to um, advertise the fact of, of of smoking. It's just um uh, it's just because a, you're an influencer. I, it's a yeah. You don't right. want the kids out there to see how cool it is. It's a vice of mine, and I just don't. There's there's no point. There's no point in me. You're not proud of it. No, correct. Yes. Tom Snyder is the uh, is the guy. That's the one. Of the tomorrow show. show. Thank you. Yeah. Tom Snyder, also known known smoking show. Uh, where are we with the Buffalo Sabers here? I mean, is there much to talk about? Do we want to? I guess the arena is the is the most interesting stuff. Or PSE? Where do we want to go here before we? Um, what? Do, I think the Sabers are a known quantity, and it's just a matter of like let's get to camp let's i mean and what i find to be interesting and i've not been on this podcast in a while because what i found interesting is what and maybe i'm revisiting a question that that, that i got that i asked kevin adams in which i thought that was a lost opportunity as far as them missing the playoffs last year and kevin adams just completely well threw me in well he, he didn't like the question and but what i found interesting was a couple of days later maybe weeks later Kyle Postal actually answered that question on his own without being asked it. And I do think that 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 what Kyle Postal's answer should have been Kevin Adams' answer. I can't remember what it was, but it just struck me that Kyle essentially said, this is a make it or break it year. This is where they have to prove it. And this is really, really should be what this team as a whole from coach on from from Kevin Adams on down put it out there that you are making the playoffs because you can't, what happens if you repeat and miss the, miss the playoffs by two points next, next this season, then that's not a successful season. Everything that let's, let's aim high, let's make the playoffs and let's make that a message. All right. So that should have been my transition actually. Uh, let it, let's reflect back on 2005 going into the 05, 06 season. Right. Or let's even go before that, when Chris Drury was added to the roster, and it was a story uh, here in Buffalo about Chris Drury insisting that a Stanley Cup photo be hung in the Sabres dressing room, and his belief was, everywhere I've been, that photo has been up. It is what you're playing for. Good it point. should be up, even though the Sabres have never won one. That doesn't matter. It's, a, it's what you play for. I want everybody to see that Stanley Cup and it was facing the wall. As soon as you came out of the tunnel into the locker room, it was the thing you saw. And I think it changed. They moved it. And then in 06, 07, it was the standings, which I thought was pretty cool, actually. Right. The Sabres had to see the standings every day they walked in. That was the year they won the President's Trophy. Um, but the Bills hung a banner of the Lombardi Trophy. And it's gotten some ridicule because they've never won one. Uh, I do have a quibble, uh, by the way, uh, because the Lombardi Trophy is actually in two places inside the field house. And the second place uh, I have a problem with. Uh, but uh, we'll get to that. But your general thought on the Bills pulling a Chris Drury and hanging the stand, the uh, Lombardi Trophy on a banner in between the goalposts uh, and uh, as the Vision Quest object. Jonah? I mean, sure, whatever. Is they it want kosher? It's. I mean, they're on their practice field. If it's there, it's some sort of motivational piece. I mean, I don't know why it matters. I mean, I think if you're trying to, like, if they were public banners, like in a basketball gym, and you, you're fooling people into thinking you did win the Super Bowl, 
I'd have some sort of issues with that, but I don't, and you know, I don't know. Do you think it really made a difference? The same, first of all, the Sabres didn't win the Stanley cup with Chris Jerry. Did it make a difference in how they play because they had Stanley cup was on the wall or not? You know, how many wins was that worth in the first place? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I mean, look, I'm, I'm posing the question because people are, people talk about it. I see people arguing about it on social media. I, obviously have a lot uh, and I've stated it on this podcast in print uh, the hockey code, the hockey culture, all the weird things that hockey does, you know, putting the logo in the middle of the dressing room, but you're not allowed to step on it. You know, a lot of bullshit. And yet the NHL, uh, if you go to their shop, uh, you will see uh, the Buffalo Sabres logo on welcome mats for your front door, which is meant (laughs) to actually have your shoes wiped off on them or on your floor mats of your car. I mean, it's all, you know, circle jerk stuff but um so well the hanging the, the build- stanley cup in the locker room is i think kind of in that realm but i did see a lot of people mocking a lot of non-bills fans of course ridiculing the bills for doing this because it's uh yeah you, they feel like you need to have won one before you can uh claim or, or show the object i think you can see it you see it believe it i mean I did a story this summer on Josh Allen, who still goes through the team's headquarters, and whatever door he finds open, he'll pop into that door and say Super Bowl. Um, if you keep it in the forefront of your mind, it becomes your your mantra in some ways. And what's wrong with that? Um, why not be think that you were a Super Bowl contender? I mean, I still remember 2017 when when everybody was talking about oh, beans. Bean's already retooling for next season. He's dumping Sammy Watkins. He's dumping this guy. He's he's trading Marcel Darius. And yet the message from the front office, and this is why I symbolize this message, you know, the Lombardi trophy being on the wall. The message from the front office was we are a playoff team. So not why not at this point, why not be a Super Bowl team? And what whatever motivation it is, at least it shows that the team the organization, the franchise is on board in its messaging, putting it out there right in your face saying, we are going to win the Super Bowl. Whether you don't or not, I just don't, I, I, I don't, ha- I don't have a problem with it. And I think the Sabres should return to this because the only, the only legacy they have right now is losing and missing the playoffs. So why not aim higher? Especially after last year. I it's actually so- mentioned that yeah. to Don Granado at the end of the season, we had our little, you know, right smoker uh there with the media and i actually mentioned that to don granado he said he liked the idea i talked to him about the standings where you see the standings uh and he was we were talking about it was off the record conversation uh, but i'm not telling like this isn't super secret but he was bemoaning the idea of some of those win you know how every win is important how every two points uh, means the same whether it's in october or april you know and uh, I mentioned to him about that President's Trophy uh, season in which the the Sabres had put the standings, forcing their players to see the standings every day. And he kind of lit up a little bit and he said, that is a really good idea. Um, I don't know if he'll borrow from that. Uh, we'll see, I guess, when we show up here in a few weeks. But um, it's it's a device. It's a psychological device. And in a league where every player operates on different psychological devices, you don't know what it is going to take to right. get that one guy you know, there's the bulletin board material. Some guys think bulletin board material is bullshit. They don't listen to it. Some guys thrive off of it. Um, you know, they're the people who say they never read the press. And then, you know, they're they're charging off the field, asking where Jerry Sullivan's at, you know, after the game. You know, hey, I, I keep picking us to lose. Be like, how, how would you know that I picked you to lose? First off, I picked you to win, usually. Right. Especially the, good, the Bills have been good. Like, I rarely pick them to lose. Uh, the last couple of years, but you'll be standing outside the locker room at the end of the game and they're coming off the field. Yeah. Yeah. Keep picking us to lose, man. I'm like, I had you winning by 14. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> um, anyway, it's like, but, you know, I, I've I, talked about this. one of my pet peeves, you know, how about how the Patriots every year convinced themselves with when they had Tom Brady, they convinced themselves that everybody had written them off when they right. were always the Super Bowl favorite. Yeah. Tom Brady. Yeah, I, I don't like it. I get it. But I I do think that the makeup of the Sabres team and the core of the Sabres team is attuned to motivation. And I think they will respond to that kind of vision, that kind of messaging, because I think it jibes finally with what their core thinking is, as opposed to what it used to be, 
when I agreed with Ryan O'Reilly that this team had troubles in that locker room and that was a, there, there was a losing culture there. Um, this has been transformed. This team has been transformed. So why not match the messaging to what you're to the vision? How about, all right, so we're on a little bit of a run here with some things. You mentioned about, uh, let's stay with the Bills for a second. Um, I got a better idea real quick. I think both of these teams should hang banners of the NLL Cup and be inspired by the Buffalo Bandits winning a championship for the you know the last championship that Pagula Sports and Entertainment ever won, the only championship that first that organization ever the won. The first and last PSE Although, championship. Well, maybe the Buttes. Did they own the Buttes when the Buttes won? No. 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 Okay. So yeah, so I think that should be the the motivation for both the Sabers and the Bills, especially the Sabers that share that building. They should look at the Bandits as you know pillars that they can look up to and follow in their lead. So it is common when people want to talk about their Super Bowl picks, uh, the hot team. They want to go with the team that people haven't been taking yet. That's why you get a sexy team like Detroit. Like people want to sound smarter than they are and they right. want to go for the team that's on the come and not the team that's had a couple of whacks at it. And I think that that is what's happening with the bills lately with the national media. There's another one today, Jason Whitlock, um, uh, who's saying that everybody in the organization knows it. Josh Allen is an awful leader. He's selfish. He doesn't do, you know, all these things. There's uh, Stefan Diggs wants out. There's Chris Broussard. There's St Stephen A. Smith. There's Nick Wright. There have been these national guys that for some reason are just seem to be concocting new narratives about how the bills are going to fall apart. And, be and it's because they have bad leaders, bad, they're losers. They have losing person out or whatever the frick it is. Um, we talk about bulletin board material, and the reason it came to mind, John, is because you said this is a team that is wired uh, to want to shove it up your ass. Right. And probably the most excited person about these things being said is Sean McDermott, uh, because I'm sure he, whether he's already put together what I would call a hype video of all the people taking a shit on them, uh, it pro if it doesn't exist already, it's going to. Well, and and my thing is too. I think Sean is being, I th I think Sean is being rejuvenated as a coach in some ways by being by returning back to the defensive coordinator's job, and I think he's more around the team, and I think that's good for him, and I I really do think that's good for him because he's got a better sense of the team, and he's closer to the team because he's a he's involved more involved in those rooms in those meetings, and he gets to put his plan into place and not have it go through a go-between, no offense against Leslie Frazier, but I think he has a direct say to at least half the team on a uh, on a more regular basis than he has in the past, and I think that might invigorate him. Jonah, do you have any thoughts so far no, I mean, after I do. three games about Sean McDermott calling the defense or how you think that's going to work out? I mean, I don't know the X and O's enough to. I mean, I think it could be interesting if he makes changes, if he calls the defense differently than it's been called, or how differently he calls it. When we've all kind of assumed all along that this was Sean McDermott's defensive philosophy from the start, and that even if he wasn't the defensive coordinator, you would think he was pretty involved in, uh, you know, the play calling and the strategy even before this season. However, I agree with John's take that there is a different vibe to him in practices maybe not so much when he's sitting at the podium talking but if you watch in practice and you kind of see his his regular interactions with the players and teams and even some with the media he seems rejuvenated in some ways or he's more he's not as tightly wound he's not yeah, a, yeah he, he seems different but more like he was in his rookie season which he did bring a lot of intensity and edge then his first year as a coach and I got a vibe. He sort of seemed like a college coach taking over a new program and trying to inject culture and change things. And you're seeing a little bit of that, I think, back in his demeanor, uh, sometimes around the facility. Not always, and especially not in the press conferences, but in some of the training camp and the banter back and forth, there was a little bit of that that seemed different to me. And I think it's related to his slightly different role with the defense and the coaching staff. Um. Before we go further, I want to plug Team Hosmer's, and I just dropped my flyer. 
I'm back. Team Hi. Hosmer swing to cure MS golf tournament Saturday, September 16th at Lima golf and country club, 7470 chase road in Lima, $90 for the golf and dinner or $35 for the dinner only. It's a nine hole tournament, scramble format, closest to the pin, longest drive, all that stuff. Um, today is the deadline to register. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many uh, spots are available, uh, quite frankly, but I have tweeted it out. I'll tweet it out again. There's a QR code code you can use on that tweet, uh, or you can visit uh, teamhosmer.com. That's H-O-S-M-E-R. Dot com teamhosmer.com or contact Lori directly at 315-289-7705. Let me give that to you again slowly while you grab your pen. 315-289-7705 for Team Hosmer's Swing to Cure MS Golf Tournament. Uh, Tim Graham and Friends, uh, once again, is the title sponsor of the event. We're proud to do it and uh, excited to see everybody out there on September 16th. I will not be golfing because I don't. But, he doesn't, uh, but I will be out there. Um, John, uh, the professional women's hockey league, uh, is yeah. taking shape, uh, or has taken shape. I suppose you've been uh, pretty dominant in the coverage of that. Thank uh, you. just to kind of set the table, the PWHL is six teams. We now know Boston, New York, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then three in Canada, Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa. Um, I guess I'll just leave it kind of open-ended. I'll let you go. You've been covering it for so much. You can probably talk about it off the top of your head. Do you think that this is finally getting the professional women's game where it needs to be instead of the splintered kind of rudderless path dueling multiple? I mean, it was just kind of just not taking, uh, getting traction. And now here you have this endeavor you well, know. right. I mean, I mean, this. I mean, it, 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 but by by me saying this is the best chance that women's pro hockey has, um, ha has as making uh, as having a long term future in the North American sports landscape. That's not saying much because of the lack of backing, the lack of fight, the, the the lack of support, the iterations that preceded it. They just weren't going to work. Um. Do credit to the national women's players uh, of the U.S. and uh, of U.S. and Canada for forming the Players Association back in 2019 and sticking to the vision that they laid out after the demise of the Canadian Women's Hockey League. They said, "We want a seat at the table. We want to say, we want a direct say in how to form a league. We want to say who will be our partners, and we're not joining anybody else." To because they have a vision, we are sticking to our vision because we don't think your vision works. Which which ultimately became was the National Women's Hockey League, the, their rival, and became which was renamed the Premier Hockey Federation. Which the 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 person that the Professional Hockey Players Association. The one, the person they, the, that they went to was Mark Walter, the LA Dodgers chairman, uh, multi, he, he makes Terry Pagula look poor. Um, this guy's got a lot of money. They went to Billy G Jean King and they put their horse behind them. He bought out the PHF. And now we have what's essentially a professional in the true sense of the word from from top to bottom, the makings of a professional hockey league. Is it going to make it? This is the best chance they have, but they've not had much of a chance before. They have the right connections. Um, Walter's got the deep pockets. They're aligning themselves with the NHL. They're aligning themselves with um, a lot of big-name people. I hear Fenway Sports Group, which owns the Penguins now, um, wants involved NHL, other other NHL, other NHL teams want to get involved in this, and most importantly, they have the talent because they're going to have the best talented players on the ice finally playing professional games for the first time. And I think that is something that's encouraging um, to look forward to. Where are the Sabers in regard to interest in supporting it here in Buffalo? 
the Sabres market would not work at this point, in, largely because they don't have a 5,000 to 10,000 seat arena. Mind you, the Minnesota team is probably going to be playing out of the wild arena, but the Minnesota team can probably fill um, 10,000 seats, which isn't that bad. Um, Buffalo is still a small market. When you're launching a league, you want markets that are passionate about women's hockey, which is Boston and Minnesota, or have large or, or, or media or large population um, areas, such as Toronto. Well, Toronto and Montreal are also passionate, have ho passionate hockey fans. Um, and then you, so that, that's why you need a team in New York City. And you need one in Ottawa because it kind of like fits the, fills the gap between Montreal and Toronto as far as geography and travel goes. Ideally, you'd want a team in Calgary, but they don't want to stretch themselves that far. And Buffalo just doesn't make sense. It's a small market that doesn't have the facilities to that were desired by by what is a professional uh, a, a, a league that that is by every account including name a professional hockey league what about the potential and, and i don't, actually don't think this will happen but it has been officially proposed by the niagara falls mayor to build a six thousand seat arena in niagara falls if the venue suddenly appeared how much would that change the dynamic of buffalo niagara market getting a team in this league i don't know how many i mean it, it look i don't think buffalo and you're talking about niagara falls new york yeah yeah Okay, people just don't. I don't think Buffalonians travel up there. I just don't think they do. Um, I, I I just don't think that that works. I I think you're even going to a smaller market now. You're going to a town. Well, what's what what is for the population seventy thousand people? Um, I just don't think it works. Um, you need a larger market, and there are far more larger markets across the United States and Canada that can support a women's that that can support a women's hockey team before I believe the Buffalo Niagara region. One of those places is Washington DC, which was passed over, which when the PWHPA was doing its barnstorming dream gap tours was, was a big seller in DC. DC also has the backing of um, the capitals Mon monumental broadcast corporation, which was a big backer of women's hockey. I can see, Pittsburgh to a certain degree, but it has some limitations as far as arena size goes. But again, you, you Calgary um, is a better market. And even London, Ontario might have been a better market. And it was one of the finalists to get a team before Buffalo was even mentioned. So um, let's remember, this is a league that needs to generate money, that needs to stand up on, uh, stand on its own. Um, sooner than well maybe not sooner than later but within ten, within within a 10 year plan and i'm just not sure where buffalo is in the mix even though it has some history some um with the buffalo buttes you know the premier hockey league had seven teams at the end um with five teams overlapping into uh the current uh, right. pwhl the and i'm counting um the new jersey team as being right. new york market but uh connecticut and Buffalo were the two outliers in the premier hockey federation that don't have markets in the PWHL. Um, I guess, and I don't know in your reporting, if you've ever found out, um, but how successful were the Buttes? And I know that they don't fit in terms of the infrastructure of what the PWHL is, but in regard to whether or not the support would be here, let's say that there is a, a 10,000 seat arena or a 8,000, whatever. Um, was did Buffalo prove itself as a as a as a market? No, they had difficulty getting traction at the Northtown Center, um, which really they had a they had a small passionate fan base from what I understand, but this team was better off when it played out of Harbor Center and was owned by the Pagulas because in 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 ironically or coincidentally, no, ironically, the Pagulas in 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 Owning that team for the one or one and a half years that they had it actually showed the way of what a professional hockey team should be run by. Whereas players had access to training facilities, they were they were fed 
fed meals, um, whereas most most teams get per diems, and even that's very small. But they were actually fed box lunches and whatever. They had every access to what the Sabres had, as they had in some ways as far as training facilities, as far as equipment, as far as tape. Tape, mind you. I mean, there were times where teams wouldn't fund tape in, in, in the National Women's Hockey League. So that was actually a signal to what the league should have looked like. And then when the Pagulas backed up, they moved to the Northtown Center, which was going way back, um, uh, which, which was taking a huge step back in terms of facilities, in terms of um, just um, what you had access to, having locker rooms. Um, so to answer your question, I'm not sure exactly where the Butte stood as far as um, in – well. The New Jersey team had better support because uh, at, because they had some affiliation with the Devils. Um, but the 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 star of that league in many ways was Minneapolis because of its affiliate because where they were based and the amount of people and, and the longstanding tradition they had since the Minnesota Whitecaps were established in 2004. So they had the history. Buffalo did not. Well, sure what else do we want to get to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What 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 else do we want to get to here uh, before we wrap things up and send everybody off on their Labor Day weekend? Well, can I ask the both of you? No, the same question, and it might get into. I want a different question. No, no, no. Um, because Tim Agreed. referenced it, but then we never really talked about it. But I think a lot of people listening to this would probably like to hear each of your perspectives on the changes in Sabres management for Google Sports and Entertainment. And I think in the context of you could probably get into a lot of the details of what's changed for people that work there in that organization. But what could change or do you think will change in terms of how these teams are run, how the downtown real estate and the hockey operation, everything that the Pugulas did and stood for over the past decade or so, what will fans and the public notice, if anything, changing or will not much change? And this is all just corporate restructuring. I, I don't think that the fans are going to notice much change at all because the teams are still the teams and the structures within those teams are going to remain until Terry Pagula wants to change them, which is fickle as he is. Um, <laughs> but it looks as though both teams are on the right track. The Bills are clearly entrenched in a in a good track, uh, whereas the Sabres are trending that way. And I, I think that Terry Pagula is tired of losing. So he's content with Don Granado and Kevin Adams doing what they're doing. I don't think that he has the appetite to do another search or to try to, um, you know, take a stab in the dark on, on the next big thing because he hasn't had the best uh, track record with it. So I think he's happy with what he has in terms of football operations and hockey operations. Um, Things behind the scenes, maybe you see it. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some fans who are upset with some of the different things that are being maybe, uh, squeezed out different uh, benefits that they used to have as season ticket holders. Um, you know, they, they, they used to get the, uh, the NFL plus package paid as a part of the season ticket. That was like a bonus. Now they are only getting a discount, uh, you know, other, they see what other teams are doing with jerseys and things. And they wonder, you know, that they, they feel like the, that the bills and sabers cheap out a little bit on that stuff. And, I don't know, maybe, and I, I mentioned this in one of my pieces at The Athletic that, and I don't think it's published yet, I'm doing a doing a, an either or about who would you rather be right now, uh, the Bills or the Bengals. And one of the points that I made regarding the uh, front office changes is, uh, or the stadium overruns, uh, at what point do things maybe get done uh you know does is there a tom galasano let's go to video type situation hey let's what's the wise idea that somebody in the in the accounting department can come up with so we can save money on scouting or taking visits or whatever or the facility uh that graded out so well in the nfl players association uh, anonymous poll uh at the end of the last season in which the bills were at the top pretty much the top across the board in every category and so to get free agents and players happy about being in a small market in a town with this kind of weather that goes to show you that the Pagulas spend money on their football team based on that poll. Now, does it stay that way? Okay. So maybe we see some things change that regard, but in, in terms of PSE being eliminated, I think that PSE in the beginning was, and I'm sorry to go on a long roll here, John, um, yeah. 
I think the PSC was a good idea. I think that synergies are generally a good idea. Um, having one person do the same job with two teams, if you can do it, is a good thing. But they had un undergone such a rototill in their front office or among their executive vice presidents. I think it was eight executive vice presidents when Russ Brandon was fired slash resigned. Oh. And all of them in the span of however many years it's been since Russ is gone, five years, is it? They're all gone. All eight executive vice presidents, with the exception of one who's kind of in a, in a reduced role and right. he's kind of you know riding it out for until the stadium is built, but they're all out either fired um, or in the case of uh, Greg Brandon, their legal counsel out with medical issues. Everybody else was fired, right? I mean, maybe I'm missing somebody. I don't think anybody left for something else. Uh, and then you had uh, Dave Wheat was let go. Jason Sinaraja was let go. You had other people who were in leadership roles who were just kind of they they made a switch. They didn't like it. Um, and so it's been it, the this smoking crater of leadership. I mean, so you had good people working at PSE in the, who were in the beginning were there to do work that seemed to to look proper. And now there's no leadership. Kim Pagula is obviously out and and not coming back. Uh, and with her there, Terry had to step in and do the things that he didn't have an appetite for before. He wanted just he wanted to own his sports teams. Right. Him in that role insulated the business from like Terry didn't want to have to deal with the business part of it. Kim, you take care of the bills. If something happens that needs to come across my desk, fine, let me know. But you had well with Kim out. Terry had to get involved. And so he has his people look at it. He's doing it his way now. Will his way be different, better, interchangeable? I, I don't know. Well, there was a vision. There was a vision, and I think a lot of it was Kim Pagula's vision. And there was a unifying theme to it with, you know, one buffalo. And eventually that vision got pieced and carved away with each iteration of management structure that the the ever-changing firings and the you know people being laid off um and that vision somehow got lost in the entire shuffle where it almost became where people use that place as a place to carve out their own fiefdom rather than being one buffalo it seemed to be a hundred buffalo or however many executives you had there it was a it was an interesting thought but practically, it did not work. And by the time, sadly, Kim had a debilitating, you know, uh, illness. Um, by that time, there was no vision, and without her there, there was nothing to really salvage. And this was really the end of what PSC was going to be without Kim Pagula. And I, that's not to say that this doesn't happen, even if Kim's health is okay, because True. I think it, she could have insulated it. Maybe it would have, but it. I think there were people based on my reporting, based on my sources who had gone to Kim and Terry about disbanding PSC in the past. And it was rebuffed because that was what Kim wanted. However, as leadership dwindled away uh, at some point, it could have become inevitable. I'm not sure, but the, 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 the hinge of the whole thing was Kim's illness not being there anymore. Ron Rakuya being her right hand man, Terry Pagula wanting it done differently. So if Kim's not coming back, Terry wants his people in there. So right. Ron, you're out, and here's my three people. Um, the thing that's interesting to me, and I, I think you know, bears to be seen, is that people keep getting promoted up within the organization. Now, John Roth is coming uh, from the investment banking world, portfolio manager. Um, does not have a sports background, but most of these people who are getting these promotions into the new Sabres leadership roles, the new Bills roles are just coming up within the organization. I don't see a lot of pulling from the New York Giants or the Montreal Canadiens or the Tampa Bay Lightning right. or the Denver Broncos. I mean, where are we, the people are just still coming up and I, I am getting a lot of um, side eye from people who are in the organization and who are outside the organization and maybe observing as former employees who say these these this person specifically has no experience doing this thing that he or she is now the vice president of. 
So Isaiah McKenzie. Isaiah McKenzie. Yes, that's right. And that's that's one of the things back when Ralph owned the team, and I used to say it, is that you know, this let's say in the like during the drought, mid-drought, just to, to pick a generic time, that if you were to open up every job in that Bills front office across the country, around the world with all the different sports teams, open up every job to the best available candidate that you can find, how many people would still be employed by the Bills? And my guess was low single digit percentage uh, because it was just people from around. It was people Ralph liked. It was people who Ralph liked shooting the shit with. And we've heard, you know, Terry has kind of, you know, Terry kind of came to like Doug Whaley for just that reason. And, and Greg and, and Russ Brandon. And, you know, it, it happens. I mean, there's a human element to that, but it was, uh, I don't know. Okay. It's starting to maybe feel a little bit like that, but the comforting thing for now is that, Football operations and hockey operations shouldn't should be insulated from these changes. What what's what, what strikes me during this conversation is that I don't think Terry has had his Jeff Littman. I mean, there's one person that that Ralph Wilson could trust. That could be John what, Roth. It could be John Roth, and it's it strikes me because they've had this 25 year working relationship um, at Fidelity with Fidelity, but but Terry hasn't had his Jeff Littman. Now let's face it. I mean. Littman ran a very effective bottom line, and it was he it was bottom line, he was bottom line driven, which is what Ralph wanted. And Ralph um still used it as a toy, but but there was there, there was money that he wanted to make out of the bills. He wanted to make them he, he wanted them to be at least profitable. So but um I so I don't know where I'm going, but there's no Jeff Littman there. For Terry Pagula, at least at least somebody with business savvy to know to 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 caution him that okay, this isn't working. This this part is not working. This bottom line of the business is not working. So um I think that's the one thing where where, where Ralph loved football, Littman was the business guy. Yeah, and with Kim is also has no more input. Uh, apparently i mean and so all of the things that she had big ideas about is now gone you know restaurants and real estate and the buttes and uh what am i missing you know the the kids in uh, ad pro uh that yep. was him and the kids uh ad pro now gone um all these all these things that were because black river black river that's terry's that's terry's passion that was the first thing he bought yeah. So that's still around. Yeah. Uh, and the, you know, the Amherst and the Nighthawks and the, and the bandits and, you know, all those things are still around also uh, Harbor center. They still own. And, but you know, they got rid of the Tim Hortons. They got rid of seven, one, six, they got rid of the brew house. Uh, yeah. It's uh, they're, they've been paring down all these different big grandiose things that they've realized they, they, they got in over their skis, so to speak. Um. So thanks for bringing that up, Jonah. You're right. We hadn't discussed that. Jonah, what are your thoughts on PSE? You've been sitting back, blending in with your tree. I mean, I was enjoying the conversation, and a lot of what I think comes out of you know both of your reporting and conversations with you guys, I'm not as plugged in. But I do know some people that work there, and I, being from here, I've been around for the whole era of before you know the Pagulas owned either of these teams and coming in in the PSE era, if you will. Um, and I don't know, I, I do have a take that's speculative, but it is kind of what I, what I think I'm seeing happening or what I believe to be somewhat of a case ever since John Roth was hired in his initial role with PSC and the Sabres and the way he's expanded into more of the operation and how they are separate companies, but he has the same executive position with both of these teams. Now him and Terry Pagula being the only ones I believe with that kind of distinction is that coming from portfolio management and looking at the Pagula properties that they own as a portfolio. I think John Roth has been empowered to manage the portfolio. And part of that is separating the assets and, you know, making them their own value for what they are. And then there, there's a logical assumption or, or a lot of people jump to the conclusion that the Sabres are for sale or that any specific Pagula property might be for sale because of this move. And I don't, I think everything could potentially be for sale because I think a lot of this is about determining the value and the worth of each of these properties. And it could 
I don't think that necessarily means the Sabres are going to be sold to an outside interest and moved out of Buffalo or the Bills for that matter or anything like that. But I think it, I would not be surprised at all to see a situation where a minority stake in either of these teams gets sold to infuse some cash into the operation to maybe pay for arena upgrades or stadium overruns or anything that uh, an immediate cash flow would be needed. And as these teams grow in value, uh, you know, the Pagula family, Terry Pagula, doesn't lose anything on his original investments, but is allowed to invest more into any of his properties and the Sabres and the Bills being the most prominent of those two. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some sort of deal come to fruition in the future that resembles that. I will say this, Terry hates partners. Yeah, okay. So not, he's so not a guy know. I didn't know. At, at, at all. And, and um, you know, people, I don't think, you know, you see people, uh, you know, the Sabres going in some ways cheap or, or, or cost-cutting measures, or we saw when, you know, Jason Botterill and the entire Amherst staff and all these people got, got purged back in 2020. Um, the Sabres lose money, bottom line. They I've been told between 40 and 60,000, sorry, 40 and 60 million. Wow, that was off for a bit, but uh, by a bit, uh, but they lose that much money a year. Um, so it's, but it is Terry's passion. Um, and he's not somebody who likes people butting in, in, um, uh, whether it's minority partners, silent partners. He's not, he's not a partner guy. He's his own guy. Uh, unless Tim, you want to, no, uh, no, I think that, uh, you know, that's, that, I've heard that, um, I mean, what change, if is anything going to change his mind? I mean, he had his, his wife helping him out and she's no longer able to do that. Does he have the appetite to run two teams at the same time? Apparently he does because he could bring in a president to, to help with one or the other, but he's going to do it with uh, John Roth as the COO. Uh, his children aren't quite ready yet to come in and carry some of that load. I, I heard that uh, Matthew Pagula has uh, ambitions of, of being uh, within the Bills front office in a prominent role at some point. He graduated from Syracuse with a degree, and I think it's, I don't know if it was sports management or analytic, their sports management school. Um, Jesse, of course, has been looked at as somebody who could, uh, uh, who could fill a role when her uh, her tennis career is over. Uh, Laura Pagula from his first marriage has been getting more involved. So um, I don't know. Um but uh, I, I, but I agree with your, and from everything I've heard, that uh, partners are are not something that uh, Terry is is interested in, and um, that goes back a long ways. Um, could it change? I don't know. I mean, he he changes his mind a lot, and yeah. uh, as as you get older, and uh, you know, you you start thinking differently. I mean, he's had a pretty cataclysmic life event happen. Um, I don't even say pretty, but cataclysmic. It is cataclysmic. Yeah. Um, what happened with Kim. Um, so your, your plans change, your life plans change. And, uh, does he, is his heart still in it? If his wife's not there with him, helping him out or, or by his side, enjoying it together, you know, those are, those are the things that we, we don't really know, uh, because we don't really get to know Terry, uh, that, that well, um, anything else on that while we're talking about it? Um, I can't think of anything. No. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, John, thanks for this. We've been at it for an hour plus. You have uh, good content. I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, this is what it's like at, uh, at Elmo's or the Swanee house or the North end or wherever we happen to be. Where have we been? Where have the good three bar. of us been? That's oh, not no. Elmo's recently. Well, River works. River River works. works. Yes. That was it. It's been a while since we've been somewhere at a at a, a neutral site. We got to get a neutral. We got to get some neutral site games in. Uh, Jonah, well, thank you. Well, Jonah was supposed to join us at Good Bar, but I don't know what happened over that night. Oh, that's right. Oh, hey, I Jonah, do we want to talk about UB football tomorrow before we go? Ooh, UB at Wisconsin. Wisconsin Week One. We talked about it last I think week. We mentioned it. We did talk about it last time, and I think we hit uh, you know all the notes on that. But you know, the twenty-seven and a half. Point underdogs against the number 19 team in the country with a new coach who coached in the bowl game, Luke Fickle, but bring, bringing in a new style of offense in Wisconsin. And that could, you know, 
potentially be something that's difficult for UB to match up with. But at the same time, I mean, this is a veteran UB team with high expectations to compete in the MAC, and if they don't necessarily win the game, I think they're going out there to uh, prove their worthiness as a MAC contender with how competitive they can be against a team like Wisconsin in this challenging environment. And if it does get to the point where it's a close contest, I mean, Buffalo football has never won a game of this magnitude against a top flight program, nationally ranked power five team on the road and the kind of exposure and, you know, attention that that would draw if they can win the game. I don't expect them to, but these are always kind of intriguing to watch to see how close a Mac team or a Buffalo team can get to pulling that off. Yeah, the the Mac uh, pops its head up and and puts a scare in some Big Ten teams this uh, the first week every year, and occasionally they pull one off. UB hasn't been able to do that yet in its history to to beat a Big Ten program, but you see Bowling Green do it. You might see Kent do it. I mean, it was been some. There's been some doozies uh, over yeah, the sometimes decades. Sometimes losing a game in overtime or losing on a late field goal or winning the game into the third quarter is a victory of sorts for a a Mac team or a team like Buffalo in this kind of matchup. I still remember that Khalil Mack Ohio state game. So that was, that was certainly intriguing for a half and a bit. Yeah. Those are also the games. Yeah. Where individual players uh, show out and all of a sudden you realize that, you know, so-and-so can be an NFL player or has a, you know, I don't know if UB has anybody on the, on the radar this year, but these are the games that you look back on in, in, in six or seven months as somebody's entering the draft and say, well, this is how he performed against big 10 competition. So yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity for well, each of these uh, players individually. And UB does not have like a Khalil Mack type of NFL prospect that everybody's watching already, but they have their best players are in many positions, Western New York natives, Cole Snyder being from Jamestown, being the starting quarterback, Sean Dolak from West Seneca being the starting linebacker who led the country in solo tackles a year ago. So if players like that, there's, I think, eight different locals on the two deep, they, they could make an impact on a nationally televised game against a team like Wisconsin and elevate themselves into being NFL prospects simply because of what they do in that three-hour window tomorrow afternoon. And Dolak sounds like a linebacker's name. I love that name, Dolak. Just sounds like a linebacker, just an, a throwback linebacker. And an interesting story, he was Western New York Player of the Year and didn't have any scholarship offers and almost played college across because he did have scholarships in that sport and went to a prep school and then had to walk on at UB and didn't get a scholarship until his second year with the team when Maurice Linguist came in. So he's elevated from somebody who almost didn't play college football mm. to being at least statistically one of the better linebackers in the country and a all-MAC candidate. And going up against the Big Ten tomorrow. Pretty cool. Pretty cool story. You're right, Jonah. Well, I'm glad I asked. Somebody can we get John's take real quick as a uh, as a Canadian on rising Canadian oh, Chad Kelly. superstar Chad Kelly? You know, it's actually interesting. A friend of mine who's a big CFL fan in Edmonton sent me a note a couple of weeks back saying, is there any buzz in Buffalo about Chad Kelly? And I said, no, there's hardly been any mention. I mean, this is the guy who won the Grey Cup last year um, and, and is having a, a, a really MVP-like year with the Argos just down the road, and there's really been no mention until maybe today um, after signing a three-year contract extension, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's been any mention of Chad Kelly in the paper, um, uh, which is actually intriguing because there was so much hype about him, you know, leaving, um, you know, going to Clemson and then all the issues that developed and then the fact that um, – you know, he he was almost out of football and has has re, regained his career, rejuvenated his career in 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 Canada. That there's been hardly little buzz about him, given who he is and who he's related to. So, um, I think people a, got tired of the story. Could I think be people got tired or waiting for the story, isn't it? next shoe to drop. There, you know, however many shoes this guy has worn over the years, you're waiting for the next issue to arise. But and this I is the redemption people, story. Which one? What number? Fine. Fine. Well, he's he's actually he's actually playing he's actually playing at a successful level. Although I, he, you're right, you're right. He was at Ole Miss again. Yeah, you're right. I went down but, to Oxford, Mississippi, to interview him, and I think my lead was this is not a redemption story. And the reason I said it is because you never it's it's tenuous at best. Like I'm not saying fair. fair. It w I, it wasn't written in the first person, but the but I'm paraphrasing. I was like, no, no. I mean, we we're not saying that this is all over. 
I mean, whether it was at St. Joe's or when he comes back and gets into a fight and, you know, the, the uh, shooting up the place with his AK, uh, you know, threatening to, what else did we have? Um, kicked off the team at Clemson uh, Halloween party in Denver, the Halloween party in Denver. I mean, so, it's going to make a great television. This has been a good run for him. This has been a good run for him. Let's not let's not bring up the past. Let's and I think there's. Well, hope. I have to mention why there's no buzz. I think I know, I know, like, right. you know, no, I get it. But but there's hope that he signed a three year contract extension. Let's let's hope that he plays through it and and it exceeds it because it maybe something maybe something good will finally happen to Chad Kelly that you can root for. But you're right; he's got to prove it. What, what struck me he's grown up he's a lot this, older mm -hmm. well, but that's thick he's only 29 i mean he is a lot older than in the context you're talking about some of the mistakes he made when he was young but he's only 29 years old which is not old for a quarterback uh in professional football and it seems like he's lived this full football life already but still has you know potentially many years left to play in the cfl and Maybe I don't really think it's going to happen, but it isn't off the table that at the end of this three-year contract, he could be somebody that could make it back into the NFL as a backup quarterback. But, you know, so it's interesting that he seems to have been around for so long and been in and out of football a couple of times and still might have, you know, five, possibly even 10 years left of playing ability, but also, you know, still a young quarterback that this is the first time He's been a full-time starter as a professional quarterback. And it's the first time since he was at Ole Miss that he's playing every week and, and producing and succeeding the way he is. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic with the way his career has unfolded. Well, let's he's playing let's, in yeah. Toronto, which isn't yeah. a cow pasture. You know, there are temptations in Toronto, which I think would be the third or fourth largest city in, in the United States. I mean, it's like, so he's keeping his nose clean in a place where I'm sure he could have access to whatever he wanted as the starting star quarterback of the Toronto Argonauts who led the game winning drive in the great cup championship game. Yep. He's kind of a, you know, he's become a star player in that market as much as he can. I think maybe playing football there. Well, let's remember, I mean, uh, being, being an Argo in Toronto, um, it would probably, you'd, you'd probably be a bigger star if you were a blue bomber in Winnipeg or a rough rider in Saskatchewan, because those are two passionate uh, football CFL towns. Being an Argo in Toronto is might you might as well be playing, you know, uh, beer league hockey because that's 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 how the Argos are regarded. Sadly, uh, in Toronto, but it's just not a it's it, it's a major league town. So, um, but I'm sure there are vices and 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 things that he can get in trouble with. Let's hope you hope after all he's been through that he's learned his lesson and can stay stay on the straight and narrow. Because how many times have you said like this is his last chance? So. Hopefully he's went won. the last chance you sure did. What do we think about, you know, three years from now, this contract's over with. If he wins a couple more great cups, a couple MVPs, he's 32. He's four years younger than Doug Flutie was when he signed with the bills. Could we see that movie script? Is he the same kind of player as Doug? No, but you know, he's still an exciting. Ted Kelly does have that running ability though. I mean, he mm -hmm. does that. So at that age, does he still have the, the wheels? Does he still have the legs? But let's remember, Doug Flutie, you know, just painted himself into college football lore for a play that was a miraculous play, whereas Chad Kelly painted himself into college football lore for all his miscues. So I, th I think there's always a buzz about Doug Flutie, and I'm not sure how many people resonate with Chad Kelly to begin with around the country. And Doug Flutie's first stint in the NFL for everything it was, it sure, right. was quite a bit more successful than anything Chad Kelly was able to do when he was in the NFL and he was then Flutie was the one guy who signed the first CFLs. It wasn't a million dollar contract. It was a million dollar service a, a agreement, um, a management agreement with his owners. So he was the CFLs technically the first million dollar player. Guys, thanks for this. It's a lot of fun. Enjoy mm -hmm. your long weekend. And Hey, everybody out there, I, I should say this at the beginning of each podcast and I forget, but Please give us a like, subscribe, uh, five stars, thumbs up, uh, whatever the hell your platform of choice uses to uh, let people know that they like what they're listening to. And if you've gotten to this point, you, you clearly are the type of person who would do those things. So uh, thank you for listening to the whole show. If you could give us a like and a subscribe, I, I'd appreciate it. And uh, the more subscribers we have, uh, especially at YouTube, 
uh, the more things that are unlocked for us to be able to do uh, what, what we're able to uh, present here uh, visually and uh, whatnot. So uh, thanks Thank to you. everybody. Prizes. We need prizes. Yeah. Win prizes. <laughs> um, I have blue sky codes. If anybody talk. wants a blue sky code, if you've gotten to this point, just ask me. Then why don't you autograph your car and we'll give that away. Like Josh Allen did at West Her. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll do that. <laughs> Hey, thanks to everybody out there for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs, and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you.